Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the closing keynote of the inaugural homeschool conference. We're so excited. This has been a really amazing two days. I think many of us are exhausted. Peter, you're looking at some really pioneering folks in this room who've stuck through uh, hours and hours and hours of events. <laughs> you yourself have, have squeezed us in by making yourself available. It's a real privilege to have you as our closing keynote. We're going to let people now indicate where they're participating from. We know the timing of the evening means that uh, we're going to be limited in certain countries, but look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon, the sunburst. You're going to click on it twice. Mm -hmm. and, then and I'm seeing New Zealand, continental US. Feel free to put in the chat as well where you're participating from. I'm going to do a little call out here, a little uh, appreciation. It's really fun. We've run these conferences now for about four years, these virtual conferences. And Suki put, a, put a, an idea in the live chat on the website that I think is brilliant. And she can take full credit for this. But I'm going to create a participant lounge from now on for the conferences where participants can come in and just chat with each other. Uh, when they are between sessions or not wanting to attend a session. I think it's a great idea. And it's really fun to have a new fun idea come out of this at the very end. There were other great ideas as well, but my brain's a little fried. OK, so we're going to move the slide forward. But you are welcome to continue to indicate where you're participating from. There's Guatemala. We've had uh, participants from Croatia, from India, from Sweden, from New Zealand, from the Philippines, from Peru. I can't even remember all, but it really has been a fun worldwide event. And we had about, I think in the end, we had about 1,700 people who signed up. And ultimately, we hope to hold these on a fairly regular basis and keep this community going. So what a lot of fun and what a fun start. So Peter, I'm not quite sure how you would like to proceed. I know that you uh, didn't want to do a formal presentation. Many have probably heard the interview that I did with you. Uh, did you want to just kind of discuss the book? Can I just let you go? Yeah, I, I, I did have kind of an in, uh, uh, a presentation here. Uh, not terribly formal, but I um, could just go ahead and um, if, you, if you're ready for me to. Awesome. We're very ready for you. Okay, so um, the the title of my talk is "Free to Learn: How Children Educate Themselves Through Play." Um, all of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, discussed much more fully, uh, as well as many other re very closely related topics in my um, new book, um, "Free to Learn." Um, so, and any references, any the details of um, the documentation of the kinds of claims that I'm going to be making in this talk are all um, in that book. So I hope that for those who haven't seen the book, that you'll um, take get an opportunity to take a look at it at some point. So the thesis of my presentation tonight is that play is the natural means by which children educate themselves. Play evolved in mammals and especially in humans. To serve the function of education. I'm an evolutionary psychologist, which means that I'm interested in human nature. I'm particularly interested in the nature of human children. Why are children the way they are? And um, one of the primary characteristics about children, wherever they are and wherever they're free to do so, is that they play. They spend a lot of time playing and exploring. And why do they do that? Uh, the first person to develop an evolutionary theory of play, similar to the one that I'm um, presenting today, was the German philosopher and naturalist Carl Gruss. Uh, Gruss wrote a book not terribly long after Darwin's Origin of Species called The Play of Animals, in which he um, argued that play 
came about by natural selection as a, as a means to assure that animals will practice the skills that they must in order to survive and, and reproduce. This so-called practice theory of play is quite accepted by researchers who study animal play. It explains quite a few of the facts about animal play. Uh, for starters, it explains why young animals play more than older ones. Uh, they play more because they have more to learn. It explains why those animal species that depend least on rigid instincts and most on learning um, play the most. So primates play more than most other mammals. So carnivores who have to learn how to hunt, which is difficult to learn, play a lot more than um, herbivores in general. It also, the theory also explains um, the different ways of playing that different young mammals um, play, the different ways that different young ma mammals play. To a considerable degree, you can predict how an animal will play by knowing what skills it must uh, develop in order to survive and reproduce. What is the constraints on survival for this species? So for example, lion cubs and the young of other predators play at stalking and pouncing or chasing and the young of uh, zebra colts or young gazelles play at dodging and fleeing and getting away from lions and such because that's the main, one of the major constraints on their survival. So this theory that play evolved in mammals so that they could practice the kinds of skills that they needed to develop uh, for survival into and through adulthood uh, is well accepted by researchers who study animal play. A couple years after the play of animals, Goose wrote another book called The Play of Man in which he extended his uh, insights about animal play to human beings. He pointed out that human beings uh, have much more to learn than do other mammals. And so, consistent with his theory, it's not surprising that human children play much more than the young of, than, than the young of other mammals. Um, he also pointed out that human beings, um, much more so than any other species, must learn different skills depending on the unique culture in which they're developing. So he posited that human children come into the world not just with a drive to play in the kinds of, at the kinds of skills that are important to people everywhere, like two-legged walking and running and climbing and those kinds of things, but they also come into the world with a, an instinctive tendency to look around to see what's important to their culture, to see what um, people do in this culture, and to play at those things. So, for example, if a child is born into a hunting culture, the child will see the ways that people hunt in that culture and will play at hunting in that way. If the child is born into an animal herding culture, the child will play at herding animals, and so on and so forth. Uh, Roos, of course, didn't know about computers, but if he knew about our age, he would say undoubtedly that if a child is born into a culture like ours, where the computer is the principal tool nowadays, a child would play with computers and play at computers. So that was Groose's theory in 1901. There's been relatively little follow-up of that theory, amazingly. In fact, um, while his book on the play of animals is uh, still in print and still quite often referred to uh, by animal behaviorists, uh, the play of man is almost totally ignored. Um, it has, uh, it's out of print. I think that there may be an, an, an edition of it coming out in the not too future, but it has been almost completely ignored by psychologists or by anybody interested in child development. So I have uh, been pursuing um, Goose's theory, and I've been pursuing it in a, in a couple of ways. One way I've pursued it is to look at play in hunter-gatherer cultures. Now, during most of human existence, uh, somebody's just asking me if I can give the name of the author and book on plant animals. It's, it's Carl Groos, G-R-O-O-S. 
and the book is simply the play of animals and the and his follow up book is the play of man um you have difficulty finding the play of man it's uh, not available in many in many books in in many libraries um but a major university library would have it and you, and i do think that there is a new printing of it that's coming out so one way I've attempted to test and um, build on Bruce's theory is to look at children's play and hunter-gatherer cultures. So during most of our history as human beings, we were hunter-gatherers. Agriculture was developed a mere 10,000 years ago, and prior to that, we all survived by um, hunting and gathering. Um, and Interestingly, some groups of people in certain isolated parts of the world um, managed to survive as hunter-gatherers into relatively modern times. And many of these cultures were found and studied um, in the 20th century, especially kind of between about 1915 and around 1980. There, was, there were a, was a period of time when many anthropologists went out found these cultures that at that time had been relatively little affected by um, relatively little affected by um, uh, Western civilization or modern cultures generally, and um, lived with them and studied them. So there are cultures in Africa, in Asia, in South America, uh, New Zealand, and various other parts of the world two or three dozen different such cultures have been uh, fairly well studied by anthropologists, um, mostly in the last half of the 20th century. So I've, um, I have never lived in such a culture or observed one, but I have done everything I can to learn about them by reading what anthropologists have written and following that up with a survey of anthropologists who've lived in such cultures in which I ask them questions about the lives of children in the culture that they lived in. Um, that survey was of uh, 10 different anthropologists who among them had studied seven different hunter-gatherer cultures on three continents in, um, in Africa, in uh, New Zealand, and in, in um, Asia. So, that study, I'm going to be quick here because I want to move on to some other things. I, I, I devote a whole chapter in my book to, um, to what I learned in this study. It's really quite remarkable. But what that study showed is that in every single one of these cultures that have been studied, these hunter-gatherer cultures, there are certain similarities. People live in small mobile bands. They, their highest values are egalitarianism. They, nobody lords it over anybody else. They have an extraordinary high valuation for individual autonomy. They don't tell one another what to do. They just believe that people will do the right thing. Um, there is a lot of interest in what people do, and they may joke, they may use teasing as a way of uh, influencing one another, but they don't, um, they don't give direct commands. There's no such thing as a boss and a subordinate. There's no chiefs. These are, people talk about hunter-gathered tribes, but these are not tribal cultures. Tribes really came later with agriculture. These are, these are band societies in which there is no, um, no chief. Typically the bands are of uh, somewhere between 20 and 50 people per band. Uh, they're not all relatives, but they tend to be r r related to one another. Uh, and people move from band to band. There's a fairly free movement from band to band. So this is the kind of setting, apparently, that um, we most likely lived in during most of our evolutionary history. Now, what is interesting here with regard to children is that their high valuation for individual autonomy applies to children, too. Not only do the adults not tell one another what to do, but they don't tell children what to do. And this is really quite remarkable. I mean, it's hard to imagine from our perspective not telling children what to do. But I've heard this from so many different anthropologists. They've written it in different ways. Let me just, to give you an example, read three different quotations. I have a much longer list of such quotations, but these are three that are kind of representative from three different observers of three different hunter-gatherer groups in different parts of the world. So here's one. 
hunter-gatherers did not give orders to their children. For example, no adult announces bedtime. At night, children remain around adults until they feel tired and fall asleep. Adults do not interfere with their children's lives. They never beat, scold, or behave aggressively with them physically or verbally, nor do they offer praise or keep track of their development. This is a kind of parenting that I refer to as trustful parenting. They don't feel like they've got to keep track of their children's development. They don't feel like they've got to guide their children's development or push them in any particular directions. They just believe that children are going to turn out okay. And lo and behold, um, obviously, since the human species survived under conditions like this, they must have turned out okay. And in fact, one of the things that anthropologists have told me over and over again is how amazing the children are, how non-fussy they are, how good-natured they are, how they look you in the eye, they're willful but polite, and so on and so forth. And I've heard this from enough different anthropologists that I have to kind of believe it. Here's another quotation. The idea that this is my child or your child does not exist. Deciding what another person should do, no matter what his age, is outside the Yaquana vocabulary of behaviors. There is great interest in what everyone does, but no impulse to influence, let alone coerce anyone. The child's will is his own motive force. This is actually not a, a trained anthropologist. This is Jean Leidloff, uh, who wrote a book that many of you have probably seen called The Continuum Concept. But she's talking about the Yaquana of the Amazon. She was so impressed by the um, by the the uh, gentle ways that children were raised, and by the fact that um, that uh, there was no attempt to coerce or direct <laughs> children's lives. And here's just one more uh, to to fill this out. Infants and young children are allowed to explore their environments to the limits of their physical capacities and with minimal interference from adults. Thus, if a child picks up a hazardous object, parents generally leave it to explore the dangers on its own. The child is presumed to know what it is doing. And this is another thing I've heard over and over again. Parents, you know, little kids. In fact, I've seen films. One of my colleagues at Boston College is an anthropologist who studied a uh, hunter-gatherer group called the Afe in Africa. And she's shown me films of toddlers, two-year-olds, playing with fire. <laughs> playing with machetes, um, adults sitting in the background, not paying any attention to this. Um, you know, in our culture, we're appalled. I mean, we don't let, you know, we don't let 10-year-olds play with these things. Um, although when I was a kid in the 1950s, we had a different attitude. I certainly could play with fire and uh, with, with knives and so on, at least by the time I was five or six, whereas five or six-year-olds are not allowed to today. Do the kids get hurt? And I ask anthropologists when they play with these things. Yeah, sometimes they do. Sometimes they burn themselves. Sometimes they cut themselves. Uh, but the um, but they don't kill themselves. And they certainly um, they certainly don't use these as weapons on one another. Um, they have far more common sense than that, as as did we when I was playing with such things in the 1950s. So that's the first characteristic. Kids are trusted. They're not monitored. They're not judged. They're not evaluated. The belief is they'll just grow up to be okay. And the second point that came from this study is that hunter-gatherer children learn through their self-directed play and exploration. One of the questions that I asked on the survey was, how much time did the children have to play uh, when um, when you were um, in, in the group that you observed, how much time? And the answer that every one of these 10 different anthropologists gave was essentially all the time. Basically, all the time from age four, which is when they are considered, that's sort of considered the age of reason among most anthropologists, among uh, most uh, hunter-gatherers. This is when a child is old enough to not have to be watched by adults. Um, the child can go off and play with other children away from adults, uh, has enough common sense not to um, get lost, not to, uh, not, you know, not to go running after a tiger or whatever the big dangers are for the, for the hunter-gatherer child, um, all the way from age four on into the teenage years. Um, kids are still regarded as kids into age 17, 18. It's really only when you are married and have start to have kids of your own 
that you're considered to be an adult. So basically kids <laughs> from that represent what we typically think of as school age, all the way from four or five on through um, 17, 18 or so, are spending the great bulk of their time playing and exploring pretty much on their own. You know, they, they, they are paying attention to adults. They're so oftentimes around adults, adults, but they're oftentimes off by themselves in age-mixed groups playing and exploring. When anthropologists ask hunter-gatherer adults about this, um, they, what they ask them a question like, well, how do the children learn what they need to know? They'll say, well, the children teach themselves. They learn it by playing and exploring. Um, so that, so there's really kind of two reasons, I think, why the adults uh, allow the children all this free time. One is they don't believe in telling people what to do and what are kids going to do. If they're not told what to do, they're going to play and explore. That's what they want to do. And secondly, they believe that playing and exploring is necessary for kids. That's how they learn what they need to know. So that's the um, general results. And consistent with uh, Bruce's theory that what children will play at when they are free to play are things that are related to their culture, skills that are important to their culture. Um, that certainly seemed to be the case as a result, the result of our survey. One of the questions that we asked these anthropologists was, how did they play? What are some of the activities that you saw in, um, in children's play in the culture that you observed? Here's just a partial list of some of the things that people gave. Digging up tubers, fishing, smoking, smoking porcupines out of holes. Cooking, caring for infants, climbing trees, building vine ladders, building huts, excuse me, using knives and other tools, making tools, carrying heavy loads, building rafts, making fires, defending against attack, attacks from pretend predators, imitating animals, which is a means of identifying animals and learning their habits, making music, dancing, storytelling, and arguing practicing argument, they would mimic the arguments that they heard the adults uh, the, uh, the night before, and they would uh, try to improve upon the arguments in their play, according to a couple of the respondents to our, uh, our this question. So, um, and the, the lists, of course, that we got varied from culture to culture, so that in a culture where the men hunted with bows and arrows, the boys of that culture played endlessly at hunting with bows and arrows. And they also played endlessly at tracking game, which is an incredibly skilled um, activity, which requires really enormous um, intelligence as well as a great deal of knowledge so that you can interpret these little marks in the sand, a little bent twig, or the fact that a, that you can see the, the tracings of a centipede that crossed over the track, and you know that the centipede only moves at a certain time of day, and therefore you can deduce what time of day this animal went by, and from all of this, figuring out what kind of animal it was, when it went by, how fast it was moving, but ultimately whether or not it's worth pursuing this animal. So this is, these are... It, Incredibly, uh, hunter gatherer kids have to learn an incredible amount. Nobody is giving them instructions on this. Nobody is telling them. Nobody is telling them you've got to take hunting and gathering lessons. They do it naturally on their own, and they become highly skilled such that by the time they themselves are adults, they are ready to really play an adult role uh, in in the culture. So now, what does this have to do with our culture? You know, sometimes I'll say this and talk about hunter-gatherers, and people will say, that's, that's all very nice. Um, too bad we're not hunter-gatherers. Wouldn't it be nice if our children could just play and explore like that and become educated? But, of course, in our culture, you've got to learn a whole set of different things. You're, we're not hunter-gatherers. We've got to learn how to read and write and do calculations and, uh, it's a whole different set of things. Plus, we're a society, we're a culture in which you don't naturally see all the activities that adults do as, as, uh, as in the way that hunter-gatherer kids can in their bands. So, um, 
So of course we have to have schools because we're such a different kind of culture from hunter-gatherers. I think that I would be inclined to believe that argument. Um, certainly most of my colleagues, most of my evolutionary psychology colleagues believe that argument. I would be inclined to believe that argument were it not for the fact that I have um, done a good deal of study at another setting, and this is where I've done my own uh, direct observations and my own empirical research, and so I'm not just depending upon other people's research. And that research has been conducted at the Sudbury Valley School. Some of you undoubtedly know about this school. Um, basically, we could we could call it a, a non-school school or an unschooling school. <laughs> it's a it's a school in name, uh, but it doesn't do any kind of schooling in the usual sense of the word. It is a, basically it's a, it's a democratic community. Uh, it's a day school, so the kids are just there kind of during the typical school day. Um, it takes kids from age, it accepts kids from age four on through high school age. So this is the same age range really as those hunter-gatherer groups who are out there playing. Um, there are currently about 150 students and 10 staff members. Uh, the school is now starting its 46th year of existence, so this is not a new um, experimental school. This is a school with almost a half-century history to it. It's got hundreds of graduates by now. Um, it operates on a per-student budget. Uh, less than half of the local public schools is completely non-selective. Anybody can go there. You're, they don't even, if anybody wants to present some kind of grades from some previous school or something, they won't even look at that. That's irrelevant to them. Uh, so this is the way this, so, so in the remarkable aspects of this school have to do with the way it's governed and with the educational philosophy of the school. The school is governed um, like an old-fashioned town meeting. There's a school meeting, uh, meets once a week. Every school member, whether they're a four-year-old kid or a 50-year-old staff member, and it's only students and staff who are members, has one vote at the meeting um, if they choose to exercise it. You're not required to come to the meeting, of course. And this school meeting makes all the rules of uh, the school, uh, decide, makes all the important decisions in the school, uh, nominates people for administrative committees to, to, to run various aspects of the school, and even hires and fires the staff in that um, no staff member has more than a one-year um, contract at any given time, and they have to be rehired every year um, for um, for uh, in order to stay on, so that's the that's the basic setting of the school. The educational philosophy is basically that of um, the uh, same as the hunter gatherer band. Kids don't need to be taught. They don't need to be directed. They don't need to be monitored or measured in their learning. Um, they will. All that has to be done is that you have to provide them with the opportunities, with the setting in which they can learn, and um, and uh, Sudbury Valley provides that kind of a setting. There are computers, there are books, there are all kinds of equipment for various activities, and with 150 kids, there's all sorts of interesting activities going on, plenty of opportunity to engage in activities that are valued by our culture at the school. So um, my first actual study of the school was a study of the graduates um, done quite a number of years ago, but the school was already in existence long enough that it had, it, the school was smaller then, but it still had about 80 graduates at that time who had been in, students at the school for at least two years and had been out at least two years. and had uh, left at sort of typical graduation age if they had been in another school and weren't going on to some secondary school elsewhere. And so my study of the graduates showed that I was able to locate and include all, the great majority of the graduates uh, at that time. And it showed that they'd gone on into all walks of life. They'd gone on to college if they wanted to. About 75% of them had gone on to higher education and uh, they were, some of them had gone on to highly prestigious universities, so it didn't seem that this odd education, odd compared to uh, what we normally expect in our culture, um, handicapped them in any way. In fact, I 
specifically asked them, did this, uh, looking back now as an adult, did, did going to this unusual school handicap you in some way? And uh, almost, a, almost to a one, they said no, the benefit, and, if, and those, even those few who said that there was some disadvantages, that they were, when they went to college, there were certain things they didn't know, but that they learned them pretty quickly. And they all said that the benefits far outweighed the, the handicaps, the benefits being primarily that they felt in control of their own lives, they felt responsible for themselves, they had a zest for learning. If they went to college, they went because they wanted to go, not because they felt that they had to go, and so on and so forth, lots of benefits. Um, we also asked them about their careers, those were, who were in careers, and uh, we asked them about the ways that they played when they had been students at the school. And interestingly, we found that quite often there was a fairly direct relationship, not in every case by any means, but I discussed some of those examples in, in my book. So, so for example, there's one, one of the graduates at the time we studied him was a, was a prominent machinist and inventor, really more than a machinist. He would build machines that would solve problems that um, nobody else had built a machine to solve. And um, he was a kid, he was a person who when he was a kid at the school, um, built uh, whole cities and factories and so on with plasticine, built them to scale. He was, uh, he would spend hours and hours, day, full, days and days, full time doing this kind of thing. And then as he got a little bit older, he'd go to the dump and bring back bicycle parts and create bicycles from them. And then he would start taking cars apart as he got to be a teenager, he'd take cars apart and put them together. So this was his passion. Then he went on um, in the same playful and uh, spirit and with the same passion to do this now for a living. A woman uh, who was captain of a cruise ship at the time we interviewed her had been fascinated by boats and played with boats on the pond as a child and uh, took time off, uh, made use of the campus, the school's uh, open campus policy to spend time on Cape Cod, apprenticing herself to ship captains. And so she was well skilled to go on to become a captain of a cruise ship um, shortly after she graduated. Another who became a uh, high fashion designer, played with dolls as a, as a young girl and uh, made doll clothes and then began to make um, her own clothes and clothes for her friends and new patterns and trying out new forms of clothes and she acquired a great understanding of patterns and fabrics and so on. Then she, when she graduated, she apprenticed herself to a fashion designer and went on to a very successful career. Another who's now a professor of mathematics got fascinated by math. I won't go into the story of how that happened, but really played with math. I mean, any real mathematician will tell you that math is purely play. It's mental play. It's an enormous amount of, of imagination involved in it as well as logic. And so um, he, um, he, he also happened to be somebody who played uh, with the piano. And he was, it was a question of which he would go on to do, but he uh, chose in the end mathematics. So those are just some examples of the relationship. When you're free to do, spend your days as you wish, Many people become really, truly immersed in something, and then they go on and uh, become um, skilled in it. And in our in our culture, unlike a hundred gathered culture, there are only a few kinds of you know everybody pretty much has the same occupation, or if there's any specialization, it's by gender. But in our culture, of course, there's so many different ways of making a living, and almost anything you become good at, if you become good enough at it, you can find some way to make a living at it, and that seems to be borne out in the lives of these graduates. Now what I want to do is summarize, that I've talked a little bit about Hunter Gathers, I've talked a little bit about Sudbury Valley School. Here's the point that I'm leading to, and that is that there, is, there are certain similarities between the Sudbury Valley School and a Hunter Gatherer band. I think that these settings work so well for self-education because they are settings that optimize children's abilities to use their natural instinctive ways of learning. So I've listed six characteristics that I think uh, are really, really characteristics that um, 
that are that create all together, if they're all present, create the ideal setting for children to educate themselves in. You know, the way I look at it, it's not our responsibility as adults to educate children. That's their responsibility. They do that. But it is our responsibility to provide a setting in which they can educate themselves. Obviously, you can't educate yourself if you're raised in a closet. And nobody's going to raise their child in the closet. But as children get older, they need more and more expansion into the world around them. They need more and more opportunities to learn from uh, broader parts of the world around them. So at any rate, let me just list these five characteristics, six characteristics rather than expand on them a little bit. The first characteristic, the similarity between Sudbury Valley School and the Hunter Gatherer Band is the social expectation and reality that education is children's responsibility. So if children really know, because they can see it, that nobody else is taking responsibility for their education, nobody is encouraging them, nobody is pushing them, nobody is monitoring them, nobody is, nobody else is, is acting as if it's their job to make that, make you learn, that you as the kid, then you do it. That's human nature. I mean, we're, we are, you know, we are cut out to survive and thrive, and this is true of kids as well as adults. Uh, the drive to learn is, is almost as strong, maybe it's even stronger in some ways than the drive to eat or to drink water or to, you know, some of these kids, as they get really involved in activities, they forget to eat, <laughs> you know, they, uh, they go through the night and don't sleep. I mean, the, the drive to learn is just incredibly strong, but it can be blunted if we push people to learn what they don't want to do, or if it makes it look like they're learning because we want them to, then it becomes work rather than fun. So that's the first point, the social expectation and reality that education is children's responsibility, the trust that children will do it. That, in our culture, that takes something because nobody, most people don't trust children to learn. So you kind of stand out. You have to run against the current to do that. The second characteristic is unlimited freedom to play, explore, and pursue your own interests. It, it, both the hunter-gatherer band and Sudbury Valley School, they've got all day long to play and explore and pursue their own interests. They may have to serve jury duty. That's one task that everybody has to do when their name is called. And there are a couple of other chores that people do, take it, you know, once you're trying to take out trash and that kind of thing. But basically, all day long, you are pursuing your own interests. The third characteristic is the opportunity to play with the tools of the culture. And I mean really play with the tools of the culture, not just be explained, not just have the tools explained to you, or not just operate the tools in a regulated manner as part of the course, but where you can really explore this tool, play with the tools. So, just as hunter-gatherer kids are playing with fire, they're playing with knives, they're playing with bows and arrows or blowguns and darts or snares or digging sticks, all the tools of their culture, dugout canoes, you know, they're, they're even building up these tools in their play. Uh, in our culture, what are the tools? Of course, right now, the biggest tool is the computer. So opportunity to play with computers um, as much as they want. But of course, there are many other tools. There are tools and you know, sporting equipment are a kind of tool important to our culture. So the school has various kinds of sporting equipment. There's cooking equipment. There's a full kitchen there, and kids can um, kids get very involved in cooking. Of course, they have to prove that they can use these things safely. In our culture, we're a little more careful about things like that. So they have to get certified to use this equipment. There's woodworking equipment. There's at various times, there's various other kinds of tools, as students have requested them over the years, and, um, and school meeting has uh, decided to uh, purchase these items of equipment because it looked like there would be a lot of use for them. So opportunity to play with the tools of the culture is number three. Then number four, access to a variety of caring adults who are helpers and not judges. So. In a hunter-gatherer band, all the adults in the band are really um, people that the child can learn from. Learn from by watching, learn from by, um, by 
by asking questions of, learn from, get help from in various other ways. Each one of those adults has different kinds of skills, knowledge. The kid would go to a different adult depending upon what they needed. And at Sudbury Valley, there aren't as many adults. There's 10 staff members, and there are a lot more kids. But nevertheless, 10 staff members, the kids are mostly interacting with other kids. So, but, so, but they'll go to an adult if they want some help with something, and they know that that adult could help them. And they will go to an adult if they uh, if they need comforting or help, and they know that the adult is there to uh, you know to solve any emergencies that might occur if somebody were seriously hurt, and so on and so forth. They will also go to the adult for counseling, and one of the reasons they will go to the adult for counseling is the adults don't impose counseling on them. So so you know if the adults were imposing it, the kids would probably be avoiding those adults because nobody likes to have counseling imposed on. I don't like to have people telling me what to do, even when they're smart and even when they even when they've got good ideas. I I just want to run my own life, and kids are the same way. And um, if I want help from somebody, I want to ask for it. I don't want them to just come forth with it. That's sort of insulting to me, and that's the same way that kids are. The other thing is the importance that the people who are helping, the adults who are helping when they're asked for help, not be judges. Because if you are also a judge, if you're monitoring the person, if you are grading the person in some way, if you are ultimately, you know, um, deciding if this person can graduate or can move from one grade to the next, then you can't really be seen by that, by the kid as purely a helper. You now are somebody that the kid has to sort of make a show to. The kid has to engage in some degree of impression management. And that interferes with honesty. It interferes with the ability to really indicate what your real needs are and what and to admit your ignorance about things. So the fact that in hunter-gatherer bands the adults are not judging the kids, they're not even paying attention to their development. The fact that in uh, at Sudbury Valley School, the adults, the staff members, are not judging because they play no role, interestingly, in whether a student even graduates. I won't go into detail with this, but the school has worked out a procedure in, by which the kids defend to another set of adults uh, the proposition that they are ready to evaluate because the staff don't want to be in the position of being evaluators. That changes their relationship with the kids. The fifth characteristic is uh, similarity between Sudbury Valley School and the Hunter Gather Band is free age mixing among children and adolescents. This is really key. This has the, been the focus of much of my research. I had a doctoral student who did his whole doctoral dissertation based on uh, hundreds of hours of observation at the school in which he focused on um, age mixed interactions where the age span was at least four years um, between the, uh, the, uh, the kids that he was watching. Um, throughout history, until recent times, kids always played in age mixed groups. And hunter-gatherer bands, they had to play in age mixed groups. There weren't enough kids that even if they wanted to segregate by age, they could have, that they could have played uh, just with kids within a couple of years of their own age. Sudbury so Valley has enough kids now that if this, if they wanted to play just with others within their own age range, they could, but they don't. They end up, you know, they're attracted. The bigger kids are attracted to the littler kids. The littler kids are attracted to the bigger kids. And they play very often in widely age mixed groups. And in that kind of play, the little kids are learning from the bigger kids. They're being scaffolded along. They're being boosted, literally and figuratively, up into higher levels of um, levels of play, uh, levels of activity. Um, the the uh, uh, and and they're also the little kids are modeling themselves after the bigger kids. They see, you know, a kid who can't read yet sees somewhat older kids reading, let's say, the Harry Potter books and talking about them. And then the the little kid wants to do that too. He becomes motivated to read. You know, it's no big deal if he sees adults reading. I mean, adults are in a whole different world, you know. Um, but if he sees a kid two or three years older than himself reading and talking about books and books that would interest him, you know, then he uh, begins to want to read. So there's the modeling that goes on, the just hearing the higher level of discourse of older kids. I mean, 
you know, it's interesting that in our regular schools, we segregate kids by age. So we remove them from the very other kids from whom they have the, the most to learn. So, um, and it's not just that the younger kids are learning from the older kids. The older kids are learning in many ways from the younger kids. Even an eight-year-old interacting with a four- or five-year-old is the mature one. And, the, and that child is then learning how to be the mature one, the carer, the caregiver, the nurturer. What an important thing to be able to experience and learn how to do. And um, all the way through adolescence, I spend a lot of time with very little kids, reading to them, piggyback riding them, roughhousing with them, um, and, and and helping them when they need help, helping them reach things that they can't reach, uh, helping them solve problems in the art room that they where they need some help doing something. And so I think that that the when in this kind of case that the adolescents are practicing being parents. I mean, how else in our society, in our society it's very difficult to um, find opportunities to um, to interact with little kids. That wasn't true when I was a kid. There were bigger extended families. We could babysit. Even boys could babysit. That's not so true today. So uh, this is an opportunity to learn how to nurture and how to and how to care for younger kids that we deprive kids of in their regular schools when we segregate them by age. So then uh, the sixth characteristic is immersion in a stable moral, democratic community. Um, this is really important for kids. We are not, um, by nature, meant to be raised uh, in a nuclear family. Uh, the nuclear family is, of course, important, but the hunter-gatherer band is really the unit for the child. The, the child's parents are very special, especially for the child up until about the age of four. But beginning at four and on, the kid is really a kid of the whole band, not just the parents. And in fact, the kid will sleep in other people's huts. Um, the kid will even go to other bands sometimes to visit friends and relatives in other bands. Um, the children are clearly motivated to learn from the whole community of people. And it's also important, both within the hunter-gatherer band and at Sudbury Valley School, that the child feel part of that community, feel some responsibility for the community. It's a little bit more obvious at Sudbury Valley because there the kids actually have this formal, this formal democratic procedure where they're voting, they're discussing issues. They serve on the, on the judicial committee. So if somebody is accused of violating some rule, let's say somebody teased somebody and it seemed like bullying to the person who was teased, so they brought him up for bullying. And if you're on the jury hearing this, you're hearing both sides of the issue, there's discussion, and you begin to get a sense of the responsibility that you have to protect the members of your community and to protect your community. So when you hear people being brought up for littering, or, you know, sometimes there'll be somebody who's a new student, a teenager who's a new student who's come and thinks that he can use drugs on campus or use alcohol on campus. And everybody goes after him and says, no, no, you can't do that. Why? Because we value this community. And if you do this, there's a pretty good chance that um, this school could be closed down. Now, they aren't going to close down the public school for that, but they could close down this school if, um, kids were using drugs or alcohol at it. So the point I'm making is that it's very important that children grow up feeling not just responsible for themselves, not just responsible for their own family, but responsible for their community. And this is especially true in a democratic society. And um, if we're going to produce people who are good democratic citizens, what better training could there be than the opportunity to practice democracy um, in the school setting. Kids in hunter-gatherer cultures um, are listened to with respect. Um, they, are, they don't normally take much part in the debates and discussions about such issues of whether they should move on or not, but they certainly feel, to be, feel that they are a respected part of the community. They expect to grow up and be part of that community. They're constantly practicing the values of the community that they are growing up in. So um, those are the characteristics that I see as the kinds of character, the, the basic characteristics that are important for children's abilities 
to educate themselves, whether in a hunter-gatherer culture or in our culture today. Now, I could, um, I have notes here for going on and talking about many of the very specific ways in which children um, children uh, learn through play, how they how play promotes social and moral development, how play promotes uh, intellectual development, how play promotes uh, emotional development. I talk about all that uh, to a great extent in the book. Um, there's a great deal of research on all of this. But let me just, uh, in a, a few minutes, couple more minutes, um, say something that um, concerns me greatly. Um, over the past um, 60 years, really since the 1950s, since I was a child, um, I, I was a child in the 1950s, over this period of time, since the 1950s, there has been a continuous erosion of children's freedom in the United States um, and in other developed countries to um, perhaps a lesser degree, but very much in the United States. Very well documented. Howard Chudikoff in his book called The History of Play in America refers to the first half of the 20th century as the golden age of children's play and talks about how children's play and he really, he talks, what I'm talking about when I say children's play is really free play, not play directed by adults, which I don't really consider to be play. Play, by my definition, is free. It's directed by the players themselves. If it's supervised by adults, it's not play anymore. So Chudikoff argues that over the past, since about 1950, there's been a continuous decline in children's play, and social scientists have uh, documented this decline in a variety of ways. And it has been, over that period of time, a very sharp uh, decline. I've seen it just in my own life. I mean, when I was a child, I had basically, I think of it as two educations. I had school, which was not um, the big deal that it is today. And then I had the hunter-gatherer education where I was running around with in age-mixed groups of kids outdoors pretty much all summer long, all weekends, all, all the time after school until dark. We, we really didn't have homework when we were in certainly none in grade school, very little after that even. So we had enormous, enormous amounts of time to find our passions, to engage in various activities on our own, to get into trouble, get out of trouble, learn how to solve our problems with one, with one another, interact with other kids who um, who really don't allow you to act like a big shot. You've got to learn. You've got to get over narcissism when you're acting with interacting with other kids because you've got to see things from their perspective or else they're not going to tolerate you. So these were all of these lessons we were able to learn. But now we deprive kids of that. First of all, they're in school more. When they're out of school, they are under adult supervision and adult direction. Um, we don't even, we're afraid to let kids, you know, so even, even 10, 11, 12 year olds, let alone five year olds, went out without being watched by an adult. Um, very different from in the 1950s. The result of this, and I do think it's the result, it's a correlation, I can't prove cause and effect, but in my book I give all the reasons why I think there's a causal relationship here. Over this same period of time, that play has declined so dramatically, there has been an equally dramatic and continuous and linear increase in all sorts of childhood disorders. Depression and anxiety are the best measured ones uh, because there are certain measures. The MMPI, uh, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, has a depression scale which has been given to normative groups of uh, teenagers um, since, actually, since the 1930s. <laughs> and since about the mid-1950s on, there's been a continuous rise in depression among uh, teenagers by that measure, by normative groups, such that there is now a five to eight-fold, five to eight times as many teenagers uh, are psychologically depressed to the level that we would likely label today as major depression, clinical diagnosis, 
five to eight times as many as in the 1950s. Similarly, there's a measure of anxiety called Taylor's Manifest Anxiety Scale, which has been given since the 1950s. About an eight-fold increase in, in, in anxiety at the level that we had, would diagnose as, a, as an anxiety disorder. Suicides among children age 15 and under are now four times what they were in the 1950s. In addition, we've got a whole batter, you know, we've got whole new disorders, ADHD and so on and so forth. Whether or not that's, that's just something that we're calling a disorder that we didn't call it then, I don't know. But I do believe there's actually an increase in impulsiveness because play helps you learn how. Play away from adults helps you learn how to control your impulses. It's one of the major functions of play, which, um, which and, and I, in the book, I describe how that occurs. There's, the, there's been a scale measuring narcissism uh, that was developed in the 1970s, and ever since that scale has been used, narcissism has been going up in kids. Well, how do you learn not to be narcissistic? You learn it in social play because kids don't allow you to be narcissistic. Adults allow you to be narcissistic, but kids don't. There's another scale for empathy, sort of the opposite of narcissism, and it's been going down ever since it has, it has been used. You learn empathy through play. Empathy, social play requires empathy. You've got to be able to empathize with your playmates in order to play with them. So the, this is a very, very serious social problem, and it's something that I'm trying to make people aware of in our culture. I think that we now have young parents who themselves grew up without much play, and so we're entering into a world where people are kind of forgetting the idea that children are really meant to play. This is how they learn the things that are so important, things that can't be taught to them, that can only be learned through play. You know, let me just conclude with this kind of one idea. Play really is how children practice being adults. And they can only practice being adults if there's no adult around. Because as long as there's an adult around, the adult is the adult. <laughs> but when kids are playing without an adult, they have to be the adult. They have to solve the problems. They have to take care of one another. They have to figure things out. And they have, they have the sense of being powerful. I'm in charge. I can do this. I'm not a weakling. And these are such, such important abilities for uh, kids to develop in order to mature into adults who can take care of themselves and take care of other people. Um, so I'm going to conclude at that point. I think I probably used my full hour, but I'm certainly, um, if uh, people can stay around and there's time, I'm certainly open to any kinds of, kinds of questions. So thank you. <clears throat> So it's really hard to find the applause button here. But it does exist. <laughs> look at the smiley face. Look for the uh, hover around the smiley face and move down. Peter, that was just fascinating. L loved it. I saw tweets about it. There are lots of really interesting chat. Um, okay, we, we've, uh, we do have time, but it is late. Yeah. And if you have for Peter, please feel free to ask it, but I think maybe we might just also give him a break by allowing him to go if uh, there's nothing really pressing, but if somebody has something you really want to ask, we'll give you a second here. I appreciate all the notes that I'm seeing here. Thank you. <laughs> I think, Peter, you, you were so generous in between two conferences to, to take the time to do this. Let's call it an evening. Let okay. you go with our gratitude and appreciation. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, for tuning in. Okay. And thanks for your kind notes. Bye bye.